thank you for every blessing, Lord, because you're God. Thank you, singers. Praise the Lord. We have a lot to thank him for, don't we? I want to take you back. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. I want to take you back thousands of years, even further than last week's tale about David. Long before David came on the scene, I want to take you back to one of the earliest great civilizations in recorded history, <clears throat> which is the Egyptian Empire, Egypt. The historians who major in ancient history are fascinated by the advances of that Egyptian culture the breakthroughs, scientific and otherwise. And then that nation became stagnant. Some historians think that it, became, it was partly due to their fascination with death. Uh, you know all about the pyramids and the other elaborate tombs that were built um, during that, those faraway days. Well, the Bible has some real important historical narratives in Egypt, and the one that I want to tell you about is just four verses, um, needs a little introduction or a prelude to it. Abraham was the father of the Jewish people, the Hebrew nation, and the promise that God made to him was going to come through his line, his children his descendants. So Abraham, then came Isaac, and then came Jacob. Now Jacob, they were all living, never built homes and settled down, but they were living in uh, the promised land that God had led Abraham to. Jacob had 12 sons, and one of the youngest was named Joseph. And he favored Joseph, which is not a good thing to play favorites with your children. The other kids picked up on it. Plus, Joseph would come back and tell stories about his brothers to the father. That did not enamor him to his siblings. And then his father made the big mistake. He went online and got a really nice coat for Joseph. <laughs> not a good thing. And Joseph was rocking that coat and the brothers got worse off in their heart toward him. One day his father sent him out to visit his brothers to see how they were doing. They were tending sheep and as they saw him afar off, jealousy had turned to hatred and hatred to viciousness. And as they saw him far away, they said, Let's kill him. This story is long. I'm abbreviating it. It takes up whole chapters in the book of Genesis. One of the brothers said, no, let's not kill him. You know, he is our sibling. And let's just throw him in a cistern and leave him for dead. But let's not actually shed his blood. Imagine the hatred. 
Imagine how Joseph felt when he came to them and his own family. You think you have family problems? The, the brothers were grabbing at him and hitting him and stripping him of that fancy coat. And they threw him in the cistern and one brother had a little mercy, wanted to come back and save him. But um, they saw some Midianite, another group of people from that part of the world, some slave traders who were heading down to Egypt. And they said, let's, let's make some money. So they got 20 pieces of silver for their own brother. So imagine as that transaction was made, imagine what he's thinking. My own brothers are selling me down the, the river for 20 pieces of silver. So it's amazing what hate can do, right? So he sold down the river and they go back with a story. They get his fancy coat, they put some animal blood on it and they take it to Jacob and they say, we found this. Does this look like the coat you got online for Joseph? And he goes, yeah, yeah. It was on sale at Neiman Marcus but now it's all messed up. Um, last call and um, his blood an animal must have got him and Jacob just mourns for so long because his son is dead he thinks and the brothers are just total hypocrites they're bad actors so Joseph ends up getting down to Egypt and he's put on the block you know slave block you know how vicious and horrible and damnable slavery is. He's on there and someone's bidding for him. And one of the leaders there in Pharaoh's court, Potiphar, is, uh, picks up, buys him and he puts him in the house. But the Bible says God is with him and he blesses him even in Potiphar's house as a slave. But there's a Mrs. Potiphar around and she begins to lust after David and desire him. And David says, I can't do this. Your husband has treated me royally and put me in charge of the whole household. That's how much he trusts me. I pay all the bills. You're running a, a lot on your visa, by the way, Mrs. Potiphar, going on those shopping sprees. I don't want to hear about that. I just want to be with you. And he resists her. But one day he's alone in the house. She makes a grab for him. He runs, she pulls his garment off and keeps it, his coat, and then begins to scream and falsely accuse him of rape and sexual assault. And Potiphar comes home, she sells this story to him, he gets furious, and he has David thrown in the slammer. And, uh, sorry, sorry. I, Joseph, I, know. I was just testing you, see if you're listening. I, know. I do that occasionally. So Joseph, that's good though, you were alert. Uh, Joseph goes in prison and he's there. And now to really reduce the story down, Potiphar, uh, I'm sorry, Pharaoh has some dreams and he can't understand them. And one of the people who had been in prison with uh, Joseph had gone back to his position as Joseph had prophesied and was next to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh's just beside himself. He had this dream, seven, seven, seven lean fat cows, seven lean cows. And, and, and then the guy remembers, oh, I served time with this, this Hebrew guy. He's amazing with dreams and understanding mysteries. You should call for him. So they call for Joseph and they bring him to Pharaoh and he interprets Pharaoh's dream. And he says, look, there's gonna be seven years of plenty coming. I mean, the crops are gonna be just busting. And then it's gonna be followed though by seven years of famine and lean years. That's what the interpretation of the dream was. So Pharaoh you know, is amazed that someone would have such insight and <clears throat> revelation from God. So uh, he said, well, what should I do about that? And Joseph says, listen, what you should do is get someone and 
have them organize it so you save, 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 save during seven years and you store up your crops so that when famine comes, you'll not only have enough for the Egyptian people that you rule over, but people from all over this part of the world are gonna come and wanna buy a top dollar at the, the, the supplies you have. And Pharaoh goes, oh my goodness, you're the man. You are, you are the man. I want you, I'm putting him, Pharaoh was a little impulsive, said, I'm putting this guy in charge of everything over Egypt. He's number two next to me. He's in charge of everything. Only I can countermand his orders. So Joseph becomes the toast of the town there. And he starts going about his organizational skills are amazing. God's favor is with him. He's gone from prison to the right hand of Pharaoh. Well, after the seven years of plenty are there, are go, he's already, he marries an Egyptian woman, Joseph. He settles down in, in Egypt. Now the years of famine come. And where does the famine hit? The famine hits Jacob and the rest of the brothers. They have no food. So Jacob hears that there's somebody in Egypt who doles out food and you can buy it there. They actually have food. No one has food, but they have food there. So he says to his sons, not all of you keep some here because my youngest son, I, I already lost one son. Yeah, and these brothers, they're going, yeah, such a bad thing that happened there too. Just, just. So they go down to Egypt, and now I'm going to really just contract this, summarize it. They come before Joseph, not knowing Joseph is now dressed like an Egyptian. Years have gone by, and they don't know that they're talking to their brother. But Joseph knows. And when they talk in Hebrew, or whatever Semitic language they were using then, they don't know Joseph understands because he is bilingual. <laughs> he's down, down, he's doing an Egyptian and, he's, and he can speak their tongue, but they don't know that. So they're talking and he asks, How's your, what's your family? Where your family came from? They go, well, our father is back up north in, in the land of Canaan and, and uh, our youngest brother is back there. And we had another brother, but you know, it's a jungle out there. It's really hard. And he got, he got waylaid by an animal and, and Joseph's just listening. So he goes back and forth with them. And finally they end up after they, he sends them home and they have to come back with the youngest brother because he wants to see all his siblings. They end up in a room together. And Joseph has now been going on with them. They don't know who he is, but he sure knows who they are. And then we read this, these four little verses in Genesis 45. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants. And he cried out, have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. And then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. And when they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. Wouldn't you have liked to have been a fly on that wall? You talk about drama. You talk about trying to figure out things. You talk about tension. And the brothers were like, what? You're who? And they couldn't celebrate because the minute they thought like, oh, he's alive, they started thinking, what have we done? So just think about these brothers, how vicious, 
How nasty. They went from jealousy to hate to literally in their heart, they killed him. If they sold him into nowhere for nothing, literally. And they didn't care. They didn't care. They were hypocrites. They not only were hypocrites and liars to their father, they were hypocrites and liars to Joseph because they didn't know it was Joseph. So the scene is repugnant to us in the natural, like you low down. Don't you have any self-respect? Don't you have anything that's decent and human inside of you? But the scripture then tells us and paints this picture that's so surprising of Joseph and his reaction. What will he do? Now is his moment. You know, if I were Joseph, I'd be like, mm hmm, hmm. Every dog has his day. <laughs> Bow, wow, wow. How about that? What goes around? So your brother died from an animal attack. You hypocritical liars. Now I have the upper hand. When you sold me down the river, you were all that, weren't you? For some money, you sold me down. You hated me. I remember how you hit me and ripped that coat off of me. But guess what? Your day has come. What someone sows, you're going to now reap. But he didn't. He wept over them. What kind of craziness is that? That's insane. You don't cry over people who took years out of your life, put you in prison, got you falsely accused by Potiphar's wife. Sure, now you're at the right hand of Pharaoh, but they cost you big time. How about those years and nights in the cell when you were abandoned by everyone? Pharaoh didn't know about you. Your brothers had sold you down the river. You couldn't get to, to your father, Jacob. And then every night, you, you had had those dreams as a young man, and now you hear voices laughing in the back of your mind saying, none of those dreams are coming true. Those dreams you had when you were a kid that uh, your sheaf would be in the middle and all the other sheaves of your representing your families would bow down. I mean, you even had one that the sun, the moon, and the stars were bowing down to you when you were a teenager. Even your father reprimanded you and said, what kind of dreams are you having, son? And now it all came to pass. Here they are bowing down to you. Oh, right hand man of Pharaoh, we need some food. Now you can let them starve to death. You can have them arrested, have their heads cut off. You have a number of delicious options here. But he doesn't do any of them. He weeps so loud that the people outside that he had exited out of the room, they heard the screaming, the crying of his loud sobbing. And it, the word got to Pharaoh like Joseph went over the edge. We just heard him with these guys from up in Canaan. He was weeping convulsively. And he, not, he doesn't say, away from me. He says, come close to me. What is up with you, Joseph? What kind of heart did God give you? Have you lost your mind? You don't say come close and weep over your enemies. You destroy your enemies. That's, that's our whole culture. Politically, racially, everything. Dog eat dog. You get the upper hand, you take advantage. Am I correct or not? And he's weeping. Well... You know why? It's interesting, as the commentators look through Scripture, that 
They find in the Old Testament what are called types, T-Y-P-E-S, or symbols of something fulfilled in the New Testament. They're called um, prefigurements, usually of Jesus Christ. For example, in the Old Testament on Passover night, God said judgment's coming on all of Egypt. This is hundreds of years later. See, after this story, Jacob comes down to be with his son, and they all live in the land of Goshen in northern Egypt because of Joseph's influence. And that stay turns into 400 years, and they become slaves because the Egyptian leader starts saying, hey, these people are reproducing. They're blessed by God. We, we got to be careful. Put them in as slaves. That's how that whole story set up for Moses. It all began with Joseph being sold down the river to go to Egypt. So on Passover night, they took a lamb and they killed the lamb at a certain time and they took the blood and they put it on the doorpost. Am I correct? And God said, when I see the blood, I will pass over. That's where the Jewish holy day is named from. I will pass over you. The New Testament says we don't have to kill lambs every service or once a year. Jesus is the Passover lamb, the perfect lamb of God who died once for us, shed his blood once. And because it's not the blood of an animal or a goat or a bullock, it's the animal, it's the blood of the son of the living God. We are set free from our sins. Come and you say amen. When I see the blood... Without the shedding of blood, there is no putting away of sin. None of our sins, secret they might be or whatever, none of them can be washed away by tears, doing penance, promising to do better. That has no power with God to uh, uh, wash away and erase the sin and its guilt. Only the blood of Jesus. So the blood, the, the lamb is a shadow or a symbol or a type of the antitype. The antitype is the fulfillment in the New Testament, usually Christ. Although the anointing oil in the Old Testament is a figure or a type or a shadow of the Holy Spirit. It was put on everyone who served or else they couldn't serve effectively. That teaches us something about the Holy Spirit. So there's interesting studies like that. But in this case, Joseph, is the type of Christ. He's the symbol of Christ. Were they jealous of Christ? Oh yeah, when the religious leader saw the crowds he drew, he gotta go. Turn to hate, did they hate him? Yes. He was hated without reason. You know what that does to you psychologically, emotionally? And Jesus was perfect God, but he was perfect man. You know what it feels like to be hated and what people wanna kill you and you haven't done one thing wrong to them? It's not a good feeling. But he didn't almost get killed or, and put in jail. No, Jesus went to the cross and died. He died. Oh, and he was betrayed by Judas. And what did Judas get for betraying him? Pieces of silver. Just like Joseph. You see the, how many see it? Just say Amen. So those guys just about killed, the brothers killed Joseph. So who does the Bible say killed Jesus on the cross? Oh, no, it wasn't the Romans. It wasn't the Jews. You got it wrong. Look, Isaiah. Isaiah, just as there were many who were appalled at him, the Messiah on the cross, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being, and his form marred beyond human likeness. Next verse in Isaiah right there. Go ahead, put it up. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds 
We are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And then struck him. And punished him way beyond the nails. And the crown of thorns and the spear and the sigh. He died and was punished for our sins, for your sins. So it wasn't Joseph's brethren. In this case, it was you. It was me, our sins. Our violations of God's law. You know, sin. Breaking God's commandments. It's a word that's not mentioned much even in churches today. But Jesus said, the Bible says about Jesus, his name shall be called Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. Not their poverty. Not their riches. Not their uh, lack of IQ or high IQ. No. The main thing that's the problem that affects our eternal destiny is sin. Is it forgiven and been washed away, or is it not? And unless Jesus was a total imposter and liar, he said, what would it profit a man, woman, if they gained the whole world and lost their soul? Went to church, but ended up not having a personal relationship with Christ. Not knowing, becoming a child of God, being born again. So, let's take this a little further. He said to them, come close to me. And that's the whole message of the Bible. Look at me as I close. The whole message of the Bible really is God, Christ, saying, come. Just come. No, no, I can't come. I, because I've been so, no, shh, shh. Come, come, come. I know, but I, like the brothers, we were the ones who... I, I was the one who put the blood of the animal on the coat. I lied to the father, to Jacob. I know. I know everything. Just come, come. I want you close to me. Is there anything in the world like the love of God? We would say, come over here so I can beat you. <laughs> he said... Just come close to me. You meant it for evil, but God worked it for good. You put me on a cross. You thought you would die, kill me. You did, but God worked it. My father sent me for that very purpose because while you were having your way, God was having his way. And the blood was shed, and now all can know forgiveness and pardon. So the, whole, the Bible is full of these things. Come, come, come. And the invitation is made. Some accept it and come. Some don't. That, that, you cannot refute that from the scripture. It's not that God didn't say come. It's that some people say later for you. I don't want to come. I don't need to come. So look at, look at the scriptures. Look at, look at the, this verse. Come now. Let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. That's Isaiah 118. So God is saying to his own covenant people, come, come. You've messed up, but please come. Let, let's come and talk. Though you have messed up royally, I'll make it whiter than snow. Though your sins be as scarlet, listen, I have the ability to wash them away. You can walk out with peace and joy. You can sleep at night with, with no fear of hell and torment and eternity away from God. Just come. Just come. Please come. Let's reason together. Be reasonable. Don't you want to get rid of your guilt and your sins? Doesn't everybody here in this room, we've all sinned. We've all got stains. And God says, just come and let me, come on, let me deal with that. Take that from you. Don't be rebellious. Don't turn away from me. And there's another. So come for cleansing. Then this next passage in Matthew. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Who should come? Everybody. Do you want to come? Do you want rest today? Do you want peace? No, but Pastor Symbol, you see, I'm, no, stop talking. Just come to him. Don't come to a church. Don't come to Jim Cimbala. Don't come to a denomination. Don't come to the Roman Catholic Church. Don't come to the Protestant Church. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. 
Come to me, all ye that labor. You're earning money and you have no rest. You plan your vacations, but you have no rest. You run after every kind of pleasure. You do this, you do that. Whether it's drugs, alcohol, worship money, worship fashion. You do all of that, but you have no inner rest. You're empty as a drum when you lay in bed at night. Come to me and I'll give you real rest. There's a peace that I have, Jesus said, that you don't know anything about. It's the peace of God. It won't matter if there's turmoil around you. I'll give you real peace. That's the invitation. That's the invitation. All through the Bible, come, 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 please come, please come. Doesn't the scripture say, and, and God sent his son into the world. He came unto his own and his own received them not. He came and said, just come. And they went, no. I don't want to come under your lordship. I, I don't want to have to depend on you. I depend on myself. And then he couldn't help any of them. Like he can't help any of you who won't come or me if I won't come. This is the gospel 101. God is saying, come out of love. Do we deserve to have him say, come close to me? Did those brothers deserve that treatment? No, but that's what grace is about. Grace is not giving people what they deserve. How many are happy God is a God of grace? Can we put our hands together? He's a God of grace. He doesn't give you, he doesn't give you and I what we deserve. He offers to us what he wants us to have. It's like a father with a wayward daughter or a wayward son. It's not what they deserve. They rob money. They run away. They're living crazy. But the minute they just even look home and they're hurting, the father says, come, I've been waiting for you. What are you doing, dad? That they don't deserve anything but a beating. I don't want to give them a beating. I want to give them a blessing because I love them. If you've grown up around legalistic religion, it's hard to even understand God's grace because we get conditioned by the other. So in closing, why don't all come? That's a big thing. that The brothers even struggled at it, with it. You know, it says, right, in the text, he said, come close to me. And they were like, come close to you. No, you're going to hit me. No, I don't want to hit you. I want to hug you. I know, but what made them think that? Guilt. See, when we're guilty and we know we haven't been living right, even if it's secret, no one else knows about it, the thought of God is not a comfortable thought unless you understand his grace. So some don't come because they feel too guilty, but it doesn't matter what you've been doing, I've been doing. If you'll just come to him and say, I need you, he's going to embrace you. He's not going to hurt you. If he died on the cross for us before we even were born, how much more will he embrace us now as we turn to him? But you got to come. And in that old chorus we used to sing, oh, that's a long time ago. I forgot who wrote that, but I remember Carol playing it, and we'd sing it 20 years ago or more. Come unto Jesus, give him your heart today. Come unto Jesus. Let him have his way. That's Christianity. Come to Jesus. Not church. You might be here as I close, as our brother plays. You might say, no, Pastor Symbol, time out. I once came to him. I know what you're talking about. I once came, but you know what I did? I wandered away. I'm not living now. Even though I'm in church today, I'm not living the way I should be. I know it. I once came to him. It was good. He was helping me, giving me grace. I don't know what got into me. What pulled me away? Well, I, I, I only have God's one word to you today. Come again. No, but I came before. Isn't he disappointed? No, he loves you so much. He's saying, come, come, come. My hands are open wide. Would you just come, please? I know, but you don't understand. No, I understand everything. I'll fix it, but you have to come. You have to respond to my love, my invitation. So some people don't come because they feel they're too bad. Other people don't come because they're embarrassed. They once came and then they drifted away. 
<clears throat> other, uh, you might be here today, although I doubt it. You might be here today and say, look, I'm not into religion. I'm not, I really don't get what you're talking about. It's all so melodramatic. You're trying to do a psychological trick on people or something. <clears throat> I'm not into religion. I'm not either. I don't, want, I don't want you to have religion. I want you to come to Jesus. Just come to Jesus. Just come to Jesus. Just come to have a, it's him, not me. How could I help you? I'm just the guy that needs Jesus myself. Come to him. But what we don't want to have happen in this meeting is have anybody fulfill this verse here in Romans. Oh, look at this verse. But concerning Israel, he says, all day long I have held up my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. All day I said, come, and they said, no. I said, please, I love you, I'll help you. No, stubborn, obstinate. I'll build my own righteousness. I'll live a good life and God will accept me. No one's going to heaven here because you lived a good life. Please understand this, don't compare yourself with others. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's not one person here that doesn't need Jesus. Nobody lives good enough for God to say, hmm, I sign off on you. Good job. No one. You might look good compared. I might look good compared to some person we find outside the doors of this building. But that's not how God compares people. He doesn't judge people based on how you and I look to someone else. The big question is just will you come to Jesus? So let's look at just that fourth verse of that Genesis text. Look at it, just the fourth verse. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. Not just come to me, come what? The Hebrew word there, I researched a little bit this week, it means like drawing really close. Almost like an intimacy connotation, sometimes when it's used. Come close. Maybe some of you are suffering, you know, sleepless nights, nervous agitation, fear of, uh, fear of the vaccine, fear of no vaccine, fear of, uh, of COVID, whatever, fear this, the economy, job, whatever. It, th that's not the way God wants you to live. Why are you living like that? He doesn't want me living like that. He doesn't want you living like that. He says, come close to me. It's not good to have a relationship with Jesus where you're distanced from him. He's always saying, draw near, come near. You never know how good God is until you come near. Do I get an amen? I mean, you can know some people, and when you come near them and get to know them better, you go, it ain't what I thought, right? But with Jesus, the closer you get, ooh, praise God. He's awesome. His ways, oh, let's pray. You know what, I've covered so much here in these simple verses. Anybody here who says, Pastor, that sermon was for me in some way. You applied it, you tried your best to apply it in different ways. I need to come to Jesus today to get closer to him. I need his peace and his peace only comes. His rest comes, come unto me, all you that labor heavy laden. I'm running around and I have no rest. I wanna come to him, I want prayer. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to ask you in a moment to come forward. And it's like a symbolic act of I'm coming to Jesus to receive pardon, to receive the peace I need, to get back where I belong. Because the Holy Spirit was speaking to me through your words, frail as they were, through the word of God. And we would love to pray for you. We really would. So don't say I'm too bad. Don't say I tried it before, but I've wandered away. And I really feel a burden here that some of you were once so close and near to him. And now you've drifted away. You still go to church and I'm thankful, but he doesn't want you in church. He wants you near him. Plus church. Not religion. Don't want you to join the church. Don't want any of your money. Right now, I just want to sleep tonight having God say to me, you did right. You told them how much I love them and you asked them to come. 
Anybody here say, Pastor, I want you to pray for me. God knows how I need to draw near to him today. Just get out of your seat and come forward. One of you, 10 of you, 200 of you, doesn't matter to me. Just come on up. Come on up, brother. Come on up, sir. Come on. Men, women, all different ages. All you're saying is pray for me because I need to draw near to Jesus. He's my Joseph. All the people here in the front, just repeat after me. <clears throat> I'm going to say a prayer. Um, it's my words, granted. But I want you to say them and mean them as best you can, okay? All we're doing is we're coming to Jesus. He's the one who said, come unto me. All you that labor, heavy laden, you're just knocking yourself out. And I'll give you rest. So repeat these words, please. Dear Jesus, I come to you today. Not a church, not a preacher. I come to you. I believe in my heart that you are the son of God. You died on the cross for my sins. I confess them. Please forgive me. Open your arms wide and embrace me today. I need your love. I need your grace. I need your strength. I give you my life. I know that you rose from the dead and that you're alive today. Now by your grace, I will follow you all the days of my life. Today changes everything. September 12th, 2021, I come to Jesus and I'm not leaving. Hold me tight. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we just put our hands together and thank God? Perfect. 30. 30 people came to Jesus today. Come on, let's thank them. We praise you, Lord. We give you all the glory, all the praise, Lord. Everybody stand. Come on, stand. Lift that band up, please. You. Come on. Everyone now. We dismiss. Lift one hand up. Lift one hand up. Come on, everyone.